Welcome into the Train with the Best podcast. I am Craig Hoffman for a quick introduction, uh, of course, host of the show along with Chris Gores. I am a fitness and media professional. Chris is a master trainer, international educator, and he doesn't ever say this as part of his introduction because he's very humble, but he's one of the best performance coaches in the entire world world. Uh, Our mission on this podcast is to bring high performance to the people, and our guest today is doing the same. Joe Delchetti is the founder of Leela, and Leela is doing some pretty cool stuff in the wearable resistance space. I would actually uh, go as far as to say I think they are the leaders currently in the wearable resistance space because they are doing so much research into what wearable resistance can do with high performance. I think there's a lot of crossover uh, in terms of the science and, and in terms of the the principles here that we're going to talk about with Joe that Chris has been using for years and all the rest of us that have been using Vertimax uh, have been using for years. Of course, if you don't know, Chris is a master trainer with Vertimax, a title that I messed up in the interview because we recorded very early in the morning because Joe was halfway across the world and making timing work was, uh, was not the easiest scheduling we've ever done, but it was definitely worth it. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Joe Dolcetti. Our guest today on the Train with the Best podcast is Joe Dolcetti, or if you if you really want to go for it, Dolcetti. There we go. I got yeah, it. A little, it's somewhere it somewhere inside me. Uh, Lila yeah. is the company that that he has founded and is working for. Um, I was talking to him a little bit before we started recording. Chris, an amazing life story. We have to have Joe back another day to tell like his full life story of how he is joining us uh, from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. That's We've right. That's right. All the way across. Work. Uh, but he's got a really cool uh, product that that he has discovered here and 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 founded um, it. Kind of the the science behind it, Chris, is something that is very familiar to us. As yep. you know, ver- you obviously a senior master coach uh, where, or a senior uh, a trainer with Vertimax, and it's some of the similar types of of uh, thought that went into this. And so, Joe, first of all, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Yeah, thanks, you guys. It's awesome. You know, Chris, we just ran it. We were just sitting there in Indiana, Indianapolis, cut three weeks ago, right. and now here we are. So I really appreciate uh-huh. the connection and um, and being here with you guys. Yeah. yeah so really. you know, from the floor of Indianapolis is where you know th- there's so much that goes down at the combine a- as we mm. have covered in the past. And you know what I really love about the combine is connecting with people like you and seeing kind of what's on the forefront, what's what's new, what's out there, or what's being reused in a different way, so that. I can keep myself fresh. So, yeah, I'll just let you go into uh, Leela and Exogen and, and wearable resistance and, and kind of where it all started and where it's going. Well, I mean, keeping it really simple, it was it was it was a story that I think a lot of people in the audience, anybody who's trained an athlete would would understand. I was there. I was literally there. As I mentioned, I came out here in, in to Malaysia for the Sydney Olympics. I was originally in charge of the Olympic program for that first Olympics and ended up being, you know, many Olympic cycles since. But in 2003, in preparation for the Athens Olympics, I was training a bunch of uh, sprinters for qualification for Athens. It was 2003. We were on the track. We were working with sleds. And you got to remember, this is now 20, 21, 22 years ago. It's a long time ago. Right. Uh-huh. Everything was new. Training was new. Internet was new. A lot was new. And we were pulling sleds. And I remember that day with the sprint coach and the whole battle between the sprinter and being told to keep certain coaching cues in place, but having the sprinter had to try and figure that out while pulling a sled. And, you know, it was just, it was a colossal mess because every time he went for power and speed, technique changed because of the sled. And so the battle, it wasn't that the sled didn't have value. It was, it was, I remember watching this whole thing go on and, and just think, I literally remember the moment because, as you know, sprinters and high-speed athletes, they have a look, they have a feel, they have a walk, they love tight clothing. And this guy had, he looked like the Asian Carl Lewis, okay? He was that guy too, the 100 meter, 200 meter, long jump, four by one champ. He had all of that. And I was watching him strut after each after each set. And he had a half pair of tights on, you know, to the knee. And I remember thinking, you know, he loves those tights and they're, they're form-fitting. If we could figure out a way to get that weight off the sled and wrap it around the tights on the muscles and the body parts that he's moving, then we would then we're away from this conversation of trying to correct technique because he would be in control. 
And that was literally the moment it all started. I went back that night, went in my office at Sports Council, went on the line and looked for wearable weight, wearable clothing. And and back then, and even now, the only thing you really had was some version of a weighted vest, maybe mm -hmm. some cables and tubings and the old school ankle weights. And yep. so it lit I literally went home. I started cutting up weight vests. I started cutting up weight suit, wet suits. I started, I spent years kind of gluing and putting pieces together. And that eventually turned into this whole segment we now call wearable resistance. So That's you really guys cool. have published yeah. so much research. Um, you guys mm. were nice enough to send over a, a whole bunch of packets and things. And uh, Did you go very, through it, Craig. Very, yeah, I, I, I mean. <laughs> I read, I read as much as I could. Uh, I, I did go through is, uh, as much as I could as well. Yeah, digesting awesome. is a different story. Um, but uh, that has to do with my brain power more than more than anything else. Um, but I am so curious because you have like this very typical in that way founder story. It was like I had an idea, I saw the solution, mm. I saw the light, and then I started trying to do it myself. And I was just. Ex mm. It sounds mm. like there was a lot of experimenting. So how much was it? Uh, as you come up with what is ultimately now Lilo, which we should mention is wearable resistance, um, very light, uh, and and we'll talk about why that's important and and the varying levels. But as you come up with the different weights and you come up with kind of the where to place them specifically, how much of it was trial and error versus thinking about center of mass, center of gravity, the impact on joints and ligaments, which we hear all the time with like Man. ankle weights, like, hey, we don't want them pulling on the, on the knee. So how, how much mm -hmm. of it was experimenting and how much of it was diving into published research and trying to, to problem solve that way? Uh, interesting. So it took almost 13 years to get the whole system right. That's how much time we spent on it. And everybody sees it now and they go, wow, it's so simple. It makes so much sense. And, I'm, and I always think, yeah, it took a lot of effort to make it that simple. Because to go back to how much was trial and error, almost all of it, here was my goal at the start. And this is where we ended up. And my goal at the start was I was still S&C minded. You know, I wanted to get weight on the body so that we weren't externalizing load. We were internalizing it. So a better weight vest. But I didn't, I didn't, we didn't, you don't know what you didn't know, right? And when we started, I was just thinking like a weight vest can be 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 pounds. So the whole concept was we were trying to get a lot of weight on the body. Because if you remember 20 years ago, two decades ago, big weight was still the way to go. No, right. nobody Peter, talked, Way, Peter if, Wayans research probably cool. Yeah. If I went and talked to anybody in the sports field and said, hey, I just created a, 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 a four ounce tool, they'd, be, they'd laugh you out of the room. Right. But what started happening is, one, the challenge of getting a lot of weight on the body is there was certain there was certain rules that the kit had to meet. And this was my background. My, my real strength was periodization. My high performance background was strength and conditioning, but I was quite an expert in periodization and the, and the understanding of load adaptation. And if you know periodization from whatever system, you understand the laws of training. And when you break down the laws and principles, you know, there's kind of always four key ones that we come back to that 99.9% .9 of all problems come down to. An error in individualization, an error in specificity, an error in progressive overload, and an error in overtraining. And some mismatch in there. So while I started creating the kit, I said, I, the, the biggest problem with weight vests and ankle weights was they weren't progressive, one. And we didn't even realize then how light a weight progressive meant at high speed. Two, right. the kit or whatever we're doing, one thing you, there's a lot of mistakes you can make in training, but there's one mistake you can't make. And is if you disrupt athlete focused, then you're probably not going to have an outcome that is performance relative because athlete focus is the whole game. That's all you want. An athlete who isn't focused in training or in competition is going to lose. Always. Real quick, Joe, when you say athlete focused, you're not talking like mentality. You're talking about specificity to the sport. Spe specificity to the outcome desired in that movement or that action. What I mean is this. Got it. If you put on – now, one thing, anybody who wore a weighted vest or an ankle weight – now, remember, that was my comparison, an ankle weight and a weighted vest. Mm -hmm. Everybody who wore a weighted vest went, said to me like this, yeah, I wear them, but they do this. So as soon as I start moving, they start moving too. So what does that tell me? The athlete's no longer thinking about the coaching cue and what they're trying to do. They're now battling some version of, okay, if I right. go too fast, this is going to start bouncing. It's going to move. I have to balance that. Focus is disrupted. 
So right. I knew whatever, whatever this weight turns out to be like, it had to go on the body and they literally forget about it. And that started, that, that drove us down a road we, we had no idea about. And the second thing is we needed to be able to adjust the weight, both according to movement and feel and speed and tempo, but also to action and individual ability, which means it had to have the ability to progress. One of the things we know from traditional strength training and traditional resistance is now the category of mostly free weights, machines, cables, tubings, right. et cetera, anything external heavy. But we always knew we had the ability to progress them. You know, you start with a five pound, then you go to 10 pound, then yeah. you add another plate. Uh -huh. Well, body weight resistance needed the same variability or else it's not meeting the laws that I just described. And if it's not meeting those laws somewhere, it's just going to become a load that's irrelevant. And so the challenge for me was I was a stickler on a ridiculously perfect perfectionist mindset. Those laws can never be broken. And we people were telling me early days, just get the kid out. It's already good enough. And I was like, no, it's still I can see when athletes are using it. The weights are moving. We know the millimeter. You you even go, you take a look at a weight that moves away from the body. You go one millimeter more in the diameter of that weight, and that starts to create a momentum. Two, right. three, four millimeters out from the body. Now all of a sudden that thing's moving. So the athlete goes this way, but the weight goes that way. Right. And so mm -hmm. so it just became this very intricate, precise process of getting a weight that became relevant. And I think Nick Winkleman was the guy who said it best. He said, Joe, every coach and trainer in the world has tried to figure out a way how to glue weight on the body. Mm -hmm. You guys finally figured it out. But now he said, it's going to take 20 years to figure out how to do it, how to use it. Because right. we've had all, we know how to use heavy weights. We've had 40 years with a barbell. Right. <laughs> we, but we've only had, we've only had a couple of years with lightweight moving in real movement. And the two things that blew me away now, the, 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 the coolest thing about the process was I was working with the best athletes in the world. So every time yes. I had a, a new sample, I would throw it on a world number one or a world number three. And they would tell me things that blew my mind. Like we started, we started sort of applying it like a weight vest. And then the athletes were self-selecting weight that was a fraction of what we were trying to get on the body. So I was trying to load up, you know, five or 10 pounds on this top. And then athletes, when they realized they could move the weights on themselves, they said, I don't want five pounds. I want, I want 12 ounces, but I'm going to leave That's it on there at high speed for 30 minutes during the entire yeah. bout of my activity. And so I realized we're thinking about this wrong. You know, heavy weight isn't where we're going. If we're looking at movement, people want light, relevant, specific, adjustable load. And that yeah. I, I would love to say I thought that at the beginning. <laughs> that was just accidental and it was the most amazing thing. And then we discovered the nuance of putting a weight here versus putting a weight here on a high performance athlete. And then we were kind of like, Oh my God, this is, th we're so, going to be studying this for years. Sorry. So let, let's get into that a little bit because you know, when, when you talk about traditional ankle weights, right? First of all, you're talking about five pounds or more, and we're talking about 12 ounces here, which is really, what what piqued my interest is like wow we're 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 loading at six ounces twelve ounces eighteen ounces and we're getting the results and that makes sense to me um you you talked about the research twenty years ago when Peter Wayan said hey the difference between an elite runner and a novice runner is the amount of force that they put into the ground not how fast they can move their feet so everybody started training for force development right and now we're we're training on the opposite end which is on that high velocity side and you're seeing a high school team run a four by one and 38, nine. It's insane. What, what training has become. And mm -hmm. what my, my question to you is number one, what have you found in the, di in, in the difference between loading proximal versus distal? Because there are some people who are listening to this and they can't see that you just pointed to the top of your forearm versus the bottom of your forearm. And then number two, going into the period, periodization stuff, where do you see this on athlete development in terms of a young kid? Are they going to benefit from something like this? Or is that somebody that still probably needs to lift weights and get strong and fast before getting into something like wearable resistance? Yeah, look, I think those are two incredible questions. you got to remember, almost nobody in the world's having this conversation. Every time I have this conversation, it's, it's, it's almost first in the world because we haven't gone through 
a, a period with the technology long enough to have answered all the questions. So two of the ones, you, I'll start with the proximal and distal. That is a very clear, We, as you know, I think one of the things I'm most proud of is we dedicated ourselves to the science. We studied this thing for almost five years before we brought it to market with Dr. John Cronin and the AUT team out in high, uh, the High Performance Research Institute in New Zealand. And we've got studies from everybody from UCLA to, you know, Loughborough, you know, Australia, New, Ze Australia, New Zealand, around the world. And one of the first things we wanted to know is, so that's one of our weights, right? You see that there, that's a four ounce weight. And this is what I was talking about, about flexible. Now, I don't have the whole system here, but basically it's a Velcro-based system with uh, compression uh, products, and you can put those weights anywhere. Now, if I take a weight and I put it on my arm and I put it at the elbow right here, okay? Yep. It's four ounces right there. That doesn't sound like much. Say I do a throwing or a punching motion. I'm a boxer, uh -huh. so you know I always go back to what I know. Yeah. If I move that load from here to the wrist, that is a 25% increase in rotational wow. workload. And rotational workload is what is giving you joint stress. Everything we're talking about today is still linear. And the most exciting thing for us is we're now changing the conversation to rotational velocity and rotational acceleration. I could tell more about that, but we did the research. A 25% increase in workload. Imagine a 25 increase workload in squat. Your athletes come in tomorrow to the gym and you say, guess what, guys? We're going up by 25% today. <laughs> yeah. They're going to be like, screw you, coach. I'm going home. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So just moving that weight from a, a proximal to a distal segment of the body already gives you, and move it at speed, increases workload on that joint and that neuromuscular system moving that joint by 25%. And that's with a small weight. So that was one of the first things we found. The second point you talked about with kids, I think now what we're starting to see with the research we're doing is lightweight with kids is the model. You said, would they start with general weight training and then get strong and then go to something like weight? weight? Yeah, Actually, it's so the I reverse. think let's, let's, let's break it down into three categories, right? You have your pre PHV, yeah. pre peak height velocity, circuit PHV, and then post PHV. So for yeah. those who are, are listening, you know, somebody who has not hit puberty yet, about 12, 13 years old, somebody who's going through puberty, about 14, 15, 16, and somebody who's post-puberty, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, so take a look at those three cases. What is, what, is the, what is that first case scenario looking at? What are you trying to do with an athlete at that stage? The most important thing is movement awareness, body awareness. Yeah. They're trying to Absolutely. get familiar and comfortable. And one of the things we do with these loads, and I go back to Nick, is he said, this is probably the first real relevant coaching cue we can put on a body to get them aware of a movement. And this is where I think you're going with that. And we talked about this even in, in Indianapolis is some of what we do with loading is we're not loading for weight. We're loading for feeling. Right. So Correct. we get athletes like it's a very simple example. We get an athlete and you talk about something like the glute. So they're not firing the glute. And we did this with a bunch of these combine guys because we found real imbalance between left and right side. And they just weren't using muscles well. And so we would put a bit of load, you know, four, eight ounces on a muscle group and say, I want you to run again. They would just walk right back and say, I can feel those working now. Yeah. And, it, and it's because it was a light enough weight on the body in a way that didn't disrupt skill or function or movement, but made them aware of that joint and what it was doing in real time that increase that awareness. And right off the bat, if you're trying to increase awareness and body movement activity in young athletes, then you want to get them connecting to their body. And because the weight, again, is light enough not to disrupt movement, cause injury, or overload the system in a negative way, you've almost got a perfect tool for that. Once you start getting in, then, then it's just pure, straight periodization as you go through that. The number two category, now you start overloading them a bit. Now you start, you've got the load there for awareness, but also you can put the load below the joint to start loading those muscles. And then in third category, you're going right into periodization and you're loading the system for high speed movement uh, uh, adaptation. Does yeah. that make sense? I, I no, I love it. That, that's yeah. exactly how we try to uh, coach our kids. You have, you have a kid who you used awareness. We used, you know, physical literacy. We call it yep. literacy or activation. You talked about... We, we can use weights for progressive overload, but we can also use weights or an external cue because we know external cues are more um, direct or better teachers than internal cues. So the weight acts as an external cue and that lightweight is for activation, not progressive overload. Yes. And then you get 
And then you get into your strength and power phase, which, hey, we still yeah. we still got to lift weights. And then that comes back. So I always tell people like the, the real period, the real progression to heavy weights is lightweights fast, not yeah. heavier we, weights, right? Well, I, you know, and I, I should have sent you that slide because we've got that very nice slide. Vern Gambetta first put it out there in the NSCA and yep. it was, you know, training and sport down, down the force velocity curve, right? Training yep. and sport happened down here on the right. Uh, sorry, sport happens here, but most training still happens up here. Yep. And now, right. and now we have a tool literally that just, you know, we've got the heavy, slow, high force output. We've got a lot of middle pieces, but now we actually have the high speed output. And like, like, like Jordan said out there at uh, University of Oregon, when because we've got a partnership with them and they brought it in for their entire track team. He said, "This is wow. about high speed movement velocity." He said, "This is about applying load during high speed movement." One for adaptation, but also for robustness and resilience because injuries don't occur at slow speed, they occur at high speed. Yep. And it's almost, nobody's brave enough to train anything at high speed with a, with the wrong tool because that's an injury. Right, and right. you know, this this is the other area we're seeing is, is how many people are using it for high speed uh, tissue resilience. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, say, I was going to say, it's so funny to me how every single conversation we seem to have about high performance on this podcast like that it was geared towards hey you can perform better it turns into oh by the way we'll also keep you safe from injury like it yeah. is so well, that is performance right right but yeah. like it is so I, I just wish people understood that that you know the way to prevent injury is to train for high performance because it is two sides of the same coin i need to i'm still my my life's mission at this point is to find a way to market that effectively uh besides <laughs> just like because it, it, it sounds like witchcraft it's like by the way i'll make you faster and more resilient Waha! but uh well, you know I, first I'll, off I'll you work had on to, that you had to have done the research you know and that's the other thing we did the yeah. research on this and and what people are doing is they're generalizing information and that to me that's always the that's the thing i said we weren't going to do now most tech companies that develop products they don't they don't spend money a lot a lot of money on research if they do it's it's biased toward their to where they needed to say we sure. knew we were going into a new area of the field so we just said we want an independent team you know, where do you want to start? You go ahead, we'll give you a product and you figure out how you want to study it. And, you know, we've got almost 40 PhD published research, high impact journals. I, I don't know a single company in the world in tech. I don't even think Nike's done that much research, but I knew. And one of the areas was around, does it affect technique? And two, what's happening from an injury perspective? And what's happened with our product, and I can tell you a lot of names, pretty much a who's who of the top teams and programs and athletes in the world that call me when their athletes are injured because they're all looking at lightweight high speed solutions that have to increase that robustness and especially talking about where it fits uh chris in the in periodization at the yep. last stage of return to play right now yep. I, I i fully applaud our current rehab and surgery on getting injuries back to you know 70 80 percent is awesome where we're weak is the athlete's mental and physical state when they're still in imbalance in the body injuries heal but they're going back and trying to figure out, I've just been off for six months. I'm not right. even walking normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the injury's healed, but I go back to the field and I know I'm not good. Something's right. gonna go wrong here. And and we get, and I think most of the big programs come to us with a major injury and 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 we're and, and that's what I'm excited about because we can go in and target it, we can work it at high speed. And on that side of the conversation, you have to build the athlete's confidence before you can get them hitting speed. And, and that's a really important part of that whole return to play episode. I so, got lost a little uh, bit there, but no, no I, good, I think that's good. I think it's really interesting. So um, obviously, this this is an effective tool for we're talking about a lot of sport athletes for uh, track athletes. I am curious as as my a lot of my training has been starting to gear towards some endurance spaces. Like mm. if I'm training for a half marathon, if I'm training for a marathon, a 10k. Um, some people consider 5k long distance, Chris, uh, what, yeah. uh, what, what kind of adaptation and, and efficacy, <laughs> very, very good friends. Uh, some might call us family, um, yeah. efficacy in terms of like, we're out of that bursty ATP type of, of effort. Yeah. We're not running a, a 60, a, a hundred, even a 200, you know, 400. We're now running miles at a time. 
what what kind of uh, research have you guys done there and what kind of efficacy could be expected if this product is used properly? A lot. And the simple the simple answer to that, well, right now we're working with the Tokyo Champion Race Walker, marathon runners. We're working with a lot of the top ultra and, and distance athletes in the world. And here's the understanding. Strength is still strength. But mm -hmm. if, if you're an endurance athlete and if, if you understand endurance, endurance has a very specific almost checklist of how it occurs in a sport. We'll just keep it simple. Running in a marathon. You ask any marathon runner, how do you experience fatigue? What slows you down in your race? They'll talk to you about the first physical things that start to happen. Those physical things start to affect a certain amount of technique. Technique starts to change. They start making adjustments. It gets worse and worse and worse, but there's triggers. And it'll be certain parts of the system that break down. Could be posture here. Generally, it's something in the stride and it's something in the front end, end of the leg recovery to the front. Now, here's the interesting part about that. Not only do they know the process of breakdown of fatigue that slows them down and is currently their limiting factor in performing better, they know the exact timing of when it's going to happen. So if you look at a marathon and you're talking world class, two hours plus, a marathon runner knows when he start or she starts fatiguing and they know the process. Now, so let's just say that marathon runner says, I want to get stronger. I need to get stronger now because I want to delay that fatigue. And they go to a trainer. That trainer starts putting them on strength training, probably for the legs, lunges, squats, bands, whatever they are. But that fatigue is not occurring in a gym under three sets of 10. That fatigue is occurring after 90 minutes of the fastest high speed running on the planet. How can you mimic that? Because if you can't get the body first to the fatigue state, you can't begin to start attacking the problem when it's happening. But you can now because they do it with exogen running. They run mm -hmm. with exogen and load the body in the areas that are, they know they're going to start fatiguing. And so what we do, essentially, we start fatiguing them early, but specifically. So we'll target a specific part in the body with a very light load. And for that first 90 minutes, they're like, yeah, I don't feel anything. Then all of a sudden they feel it. Then that load is doubling and tripling the fatigue. Now put them through that training program for six or eight weeks. What do you think will happen to those neuromuscular breakdowns or those fatigue components? They're going to improve. Right. You have to, overload. Yes. Again, and you have to target problems where it's sort of like, you know, you have to meet people where they're at. You have to meet problems where they're at. That's why a lot of these endurance athletes get frustrated because they go to trainers, they get stronger. They say, yeah, I feel strong. And then they get to that wall in the race and it's the same wall. Yeah. You have to target endurance fatigue when it's happening. And we, you know, we helped set the world record in the Ironman with Dan Plews, who's the world record holder, specifically on the run. And we've done that so a lot with endurance athletes. And it's not as complex as people think. You get on the right piece of kit, you have it on in your training runs, you have it on to build resilience in your endurance. And if you can build it, if you can do a two hour run loaded with a light weight in the right spot, and you do that for six weeks and you take that load off and race, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. You know, You're at the end of the day, free. yeah, it's still, this is the best part. It's, we're not talking about magnets or nutrition. This is weight training. Right. And it, and right. it's just lightweight applied to the body in a way that allows you to still do your activity, you know, in, in a simple nutshell. Yeah. So let's wrap up here as we have just about three minutes uh, left of time here uh, before I have to go train myself. Uh, so what uh like if, he, if people are like okay i'm interested like is this something that is available for the masses is this something that's still yeah. happening at elite levels um how do how do one folks get lila but two also like is there do you guys have training plans like how, how what's the recommended use here are we talking about wearing it every training session are we talking about wearing it specific uh types of training sessions like what what are the answers to those two questions high speed loading light or not is still loading so periodization applies we generally load every second day we keep the load dosing to no more than about 50 percent of your workout so so you don't have to do extra workout with this you wear it let's say you're a track athlete you'll go down you put it on you wear it for like calf sleeves for your warm-up because that builds your resilience and your conditioning of your legs you'll wear it for part of your main session some of your runs then you strip it off and you finish light and you'll do that two to three. It's just like weight training. If you've got somebody weight training once a week, that's a maintenance dose, regardless of what you're doing. So you're going to need at least two to three doses a week on alternate days. And anybody who's a trainer, if you understand basic periodization for weight training, well, high speed light load training is kind of the same. 
you know, and the only thing we also recommend is you never sacrifice movement quality for load. You don't try and do more. If you see them tired, you take the load off rather than say, come on, you could do two more because the whole, remember what I said at the beginning, focus and technique are what win. So don't move them away from that. Don't turn it into just another sled workout, I'll t- you know? Got and it. so Got it. we keep, yeah, we keep it at movement quality. And how, how do people order? How do people get some of the equipment? You just go to uh, uh, leelateam.com and that'll link you to our YouTube page. It'll, you, you download the app. The app is free. We have training programs constantly being updated in the app. And if you ever, uh, if you ever have a question, just find me. I'm easy to find. All right. Love that. Uh, this was really cool. Really interesting. Um, Joe, your story is also very cool and very interesting. No, uh, really appreciate your time. <laughs> really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks so much for joining us here on the train with the best podcast. Well, let's train with the best.